dear listener, now here's a question for you. What impact would it have on your day to day or even your week if people just cared a little bit more if they were engaged with what you were trying to get them to do maybe you're working on a project at the minute maybe you're trying to get more people on board or bought into your idea maybe you're trying to get a job or a promotion or get new clients wouldn't it make life so much easier if they cared more or what we're going to approach today is wouldn't it be so much better if they gave more of a shit by the way if you're not okay with that kind of language I'm afraid you might be in for a shock for this week's episode because today I'm going to be talking to you about something I like to call give a shitology now give a shitology is the art of helping people give more of a shit it care more to get engaged usually these are the reasons and the stumbling blocks we come across at work and in business Now, we talk about tech and adoption and AI and transformations and change in business, because if you're not changing, you're slowly dying. If you're not growing, you're actually going backwards a bit. And that requires people to get on board. That requires people to go with you on that journey. So whether you are trying to get more sales in your business or whether you're trying to get advancement on some software, you're going to try to get people to do more things. We're going to talk about actually how you can get people to give a shit and what the key barriers are about why they don't and what you can do to overcome this. So here's the thing. What happened and how this came about was the fact that, well, all of the work that I do with clients is really about those keywords, influence, persuasion, but actually looking at how we can solve big problems by getting people engaged. And ultimately, once we get people engaged, we can actually change behavior and encourage behavior and motivate. So that's one of the things we really want to do. It means that you get people more productive. It means that you are going to stop wasting hours and banging your head against a wall when you're coming up with problems. And it certainly means that you are going to get more people that like you and and go towards you and flock towards you. And it just makes life a lot easier. Now, think about it this way. When we are creating content of any kind from white papers to going networking, I call that content because you're generating relationships. It's all about the engagement. That's what we do. When we have issues with the computer, (laughs) the first thing the tech guy says is usually, did you turn it on and off again? Because we always think it's a human error. And there was some really, it was a really interesting video actually I was watching as I was mindlessly scrolling probably through Instagram one late night. But it's brilliant because you're getting a lot more academics on there as well, voicing their opinions and saying stuff in some really clear ways. And So engagement, this is one thing. One of the things we get from engagement is also accountability. Now, this video uh, was actually saying about how AI was stealing our jobs. And a really good, really good way of saying it's always people and engagement at the bottom of this is this academic uh, professor. She was saying, well, it's no, it's not AI. AI is just there. It's just sat there doing its thing. It's not choosing to do anything. It's not making a decision. That, my friend, is a human that's deciding to do that. A human will be deciding, potentially, I don't know what you do, but with your job to go, well, actually, we can do this quicker and faster. This is more efficient to use a new automated process or new AI adoption that's a human doing that. And the human is to be accountable. So not the AI. So that actually even the language that we use to engage people really needs to be looked at because we see these scary headlines where we're putting the emphasis on robotics or things that actually can't be blamed so far. And actually engagement means that we can be a lot more accountable to our actions as well. So I think all around when we work on engaging people, it is a fascinating process. But what is stopping people 
from getting engaged? Well, glad you asked. <laughs> We're going to go through that. And at the end of this show, I'm also going to give you some exercises to look at so you can go back to work after this and you can actually really look at, right, how can I make more of an impact in what I'm doing? How can I be more innovative? How can I help the people in my business be more engaged with me, my ideas and my concepts? So keep listening if that's the case. Okay, so what are the key barriers that stop people from being engaged? Well, number one thing is that I notice that a lot of people, again, look at process and look at these wonderful logical solutions. In fact, last week I was hosting a roundtable at, at an accounting and IT, strategic IT conference. And this was the thing. We've got some really incredibly smart people coming to this conference and sat around. We've got CTOs, we've got directors of innovation, and everyone is coming up with really brilliant, logical, measurable ways of creating solutions for for instance, tech adoption, that's what my session was on. But that doesn't account for the human factor, which is what I'm, I'm talking about, is that human factor. We need to look at behaviors and why people do the things they do. Now, one problem we have is that a lot of solutions are created. A lot of the things you're doing in your business are created on what we call uh, say data which is where we gather feedback forms or we have conversations. And that's really valuable. It's so valuable to get that information. But people lie. <laughs> Not deliberately. Not deliberately all the time. Sometimes deliberately. But if we're creating or if you're creating solutions based on what people say, then that means that you are going to come up against some huge barriers because your data is Lord, people don't know sometimes what they want. I mean, I I do think that this is why we ended up with a boat called Boaty Mc Boatface. Um, <laughs> it's not always the best idea because it's not actually thinking deeply about what they want. Now, case in point, have you ever heard of this this argument? This might be at home or it might be somewhere in the office where someone comes. Well, not in the office, but. For instance, imagine I go home and I'm opening up the cupboard doors of the fridges and I'm going, oh, I'm hungry. And Mr. BB turns around and says, OK, well, we've got some soup. Shall I heat you up some soup? Like, no, I don't want soup. I don't want soup. That sounds ridiculous. OK, well, I tell you what, I've got some leftover roast chicken. I can make your chicken sandwich. No, I don't want a chicken sandwich. Oh, well, why not just have a quick snack? Why not have an apple or a banana or something? No, I don't want a banana. No. Who here has been in that dynamic where you keep offering suggestions and suggestions and suggestions to someone who is saying that they have a problem and they want help? How is this you? Are you nodding right now? This could be. Now, what happens usually is that the person who's offering lots of help and very you know, great solutions is then getting frustrated and angry and then turns around and goes, fine, whatever you want, just leave me out of it and then suddenly the tables have turned and the person goes why are you talking to me like that oh and why well, just wanted some help with lunch now of course the real problem is as i was saying we're adopting the logical solution the logic of this scenario is that i am asking i'm looking at the fridge and i'm going oh i don't know what to have for lunch now the realistic and logical solution is to point out as Mr. BB usually does, is to point out all of the options and offer them as solutions. Sometimes it's not that simple. People do not do things because of logic. And you'll know this because you'll know this. Well, let's see. What did you have for breakfast this morning? Was that a logical decision or was it a want decision? I often think jam is a bizarre thing. Why would we have reams of sugar with a bit of fruit in as a staple for our breakfast foods. But yet we do. It's the norm. Again, logical things. Actually, if we thought about it, why would we ever drink alcohol? It's not that logical, but it can be warming and fun and joyful. What else? Chocolate biscuits. What is the point of a biscuit or a cake? No less. There is no logic to it. It is unhealthy. It is fatty. It doesn't give you much energy or substance, certainly no nutrients. So why do we do it? Um, 
again, it is something more than logic. It is chaos and joy and human traits all combined. So you have to think of these in your solutions. Now, going back to me and Mr. BB in the fridge scenario that I'm painting for you, imagine this. What really was being said underneath it all? Now, we've got the say data. When the say data is what I'm saying, I'm looking at the fridge saying I want lunch. But what I'm doing by rejecting everything is very different. What we see is actually someone who is searching for something, in need of something, and they're not sure what that is. But the conversation isn't about lunch at all. And this is usually why we need to get something called do data, which is what are people doing? And that is where we actually look at behaviors and we actually look at what people really need. And I think, and that's one of my favorite coaching questions actually is, what do you need? What do you need in this moment? So this is where it's really great to have a framework to help you guide through, well, how do I even navigate this do data? Where do I start? What do I do to create a solution that actually approaches what the real need is rather than what people are saying the need is? So what I have here is a really simple and easy model by a behavioral scientist called Bree Williams called the Williams model, Williams behavioral change model. And I'll put a little download of it in the notes here so that you can you can get the PDF there and you can work through it or just shout to me if you would like the behavioral change model and I'll make sure I get it sent to you. So here is the first one. So these are the barriers. What stops people engaging? What you need to look at to get do data. So the first one is, where are they being lazy? Oh, and that really is apathy. Now we do this in a lot of ways, don't we? Is where we just don't take action because it seems a little bit too hard. This could even be simple ways of like how you design forms, how you get people to give feedback, how you get people to respond to things. Sometimes if it's too cognitively there's too much of a cognitive load we'll go oh I'll do that later or we'll shove it aside and suddenly that becomes a behavioral barrier that we're up against so if you're trying to get people to engage and with something new then the first thing is to look at what right what are we instantly what steps have we got in this process that are making people go oh okay I haven't got time for this or this isn't an urgent thing now, we often see this with things like CPD training or depending on where you are, it could be called CCE or continuing professional development of any kind or compliance training. We know that it's important, but often it is not urgent until the last minute when your managers are chasing people. So this is the thing. How do we make it really easy, really simple to be able to go in? Do we put it in people's diaries? Do we say you get some, you know, put some reward at the end of it? Do we actually say there'll be a fine at the end of it? There was actually a study done with bus drivers in America where they needed them to park a certain distance or drive a certain distance. And what they found is, is that if they, they would reward them at the end of the month. And so they'd get $100 if they had found the cameras had found consistently that they were parking this distance apart. So this worked initially. But of course, the more we get used to something like that, the more it drops down because we become a bit compliant, a bit lazy. So what did the behavioral scientists look at in this instance? Well, they said, oh, well, what do we know? We know that actually frequency, so that might be a bit too long to receive the reward. So what if we shortened it? And what they did was said, okay, you'll get $25 a week if you reach this week's target. So yet again, they got high consistency and the drop down wasn't too bad. It was a lot better than it was by monthly, but we still saw a bit of a drop down. So the scientists went back to the drawing board. What other solutions could we create to make this really easy for them? And then they came up with, well, hmm, may, we know scientifically that actually we, we do respond well to reward, but not consistently. So if we consistently, we start to get a bit bored, we get a bit 
apathetical, a bit lazy about it, but we're much more likely to move away from pain than we are towards pleasure, ridiculous as it sounds. But this is why taxes, this is why we don't get reward, rewarded when we get taxes. So what happened was they actually did it the opposite way. They said, you will get $25 a week, but we all, we are going to give you $100. But every week, if you have missed, if you have missed the target, if you have not hit your target, we're going to deduct 25 pounds of dollars. We are going to deduct $25 out of that 100. Now, suddenly this kept a much more consistent level of behavior change. And that was what worked. So that is something that they looked at the solution and how they resolved it. So that's apathy. The next one is paralysis. Classic choice, the choice paradox, we call it. We have too much choice. We get overwhelmed. We don't know what to do. And if we have enough choice, uh, you know, just one choice, sometimes we, we want to have more power and autonomy. So what we need is just a little bit of choice. (laughs) So that's why usually any marketers, they go for the power of three because three is really easy to remember. Three makes us feel like we still have control over the situation. We have autonomy, but also we've got a choice. (laughs) So look at, if you're having uh, any issues, look at that as a behavior barrier. Okay. Where are we overwhelming people? Where is this too much? How can we create an opportunity for less overwhelm? So it doesn't even mean reducing choices. It could be when are they time poor? Do they have time to look at this new resource we're giving them or this new process we're trying to get them to adopt? have a look at that and how have you made it not only easy, but actually simple to do. They're not going to have to sit down and take in loads of information. They'll walk through it. It's natural. It's intuitive. This is why things like the Netflix interface work so well, because it is intuitive. The iPhone design works fantastically well. Kids know what to do. It's with a thumb scroll. It is based on how behavior and human behavior works, not just the the logical idea is based on do data, not say data. So the last one, the last one out of the three behavioral issues is, of course, fear. Huge one. It can be a really powerful motivator, can be a huge source of, of paralysis as well. So what are they scared of? Now, if it comes to change, so I'll go back to tech adoption as an example, fear is a huge one because we don't tend to favor change, not a lot of the time. So where could you reduce fear? Now, this is where it comes down to you guys, the people who are leading the change and anyone above um, your change champions, as it were, you need to be the voice and a trusted voice can't just be anyone. Now imagine the person that you are really bad at taking advice from. For some reason, it's usually someone at home, maybe, you know, again, your spouse or your mom or your dad or something like that. That classic case of, yeah, I know, you know, it's why they say never, never get your, (laughs) it's like never get your parents or something to teach you to drive or someone close to you because we can often end up almost like snapping at them and it's always a bad idea. They say, if you do it one removed, you know, it's a lot better an idea. Take advice from that person a lot better. So the question is, are you someone that they are going to take advice from? Are you respected? Are you trusted? And this is something I've also worked with people on is how you speak, how you are perceived. What do you need to do to shape people's perceptions so that they can see that you are the person to be listened to, to be trusted to? At the end of the day, again, we're dealing with humans. Humans do judge. We do stereotype. Now, that doesn't mean that does not mean you play to a stereotype. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you look at how you are do data being perceived, not your idea of being perceived and see if there are any barriers there and what you can do to help alleviate the situation. 
Okay. That's all it means. <laughs> I actually, I did a session a couple of weeks ago for a group where we were talking about different styles of communication and how people who are very direct can be very blunt, perceived as being blunt <laughs> at least. And then that can cause friction with another certain personality type. I had an email back from one of the attendees saying, I'm really worried now that I'm I'm upsetting people because I am very blunt and I'm very direct and I can be uh, very results driven. So what do I do? And I said, I sent an email back going, is this something that you know is happening or is this just a fear? And at which point I got an email back going, you're absolutely right. I have no idea. I've just made this up in my head. <laughs> and I went, oh, there we go. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Because sometimes we do put stories in our own head about what's happening uh, and that can be dangerous. So we need to look at the evidence of what's really happening there. Okay, so when we're looking at fear and scarcity, who can you be to be the trusted voice? Look at what people are doing. Are people listening to you? Are they coming to you for advice? What do you know to be true is the great question to ask. And also, what are you doing to really paint a vision of the future? A great way to alleviate any fear is by saying, this is what I see. And, pay, and being able to create content kind of campaigns, being able to present an idea and a story so powerful and so trusted that laces logic and the illogical together, the emotional side, as well as the, the data driven side in a, such a powerful way that people go, I'm on board. Fear's gone. I'm not worried. I'm jumping in. And you will have experienced this on many levels. Of course, the kind of evangelists or people that we look to, like the famous people, people like Steve Jobs, who are so great about painting an image and having people see what he saw. And that's what you need to be able to do as well if you're going to help people overcome the scarcity factor. So a lot of the time they can't see what you see. You've got to be able to get what's in your heads out there and have people as passionate and as engaged in it as you are. So those are three of the ways, the three barriers that stop people from getting engaged, from giving a shit. And that's what you really need to do to get that give a shitology going in your business or in your life is to get people really caring. You have to embrace those three barriers. Look at what you're doing, not what people are saying and create solutions around that. Now, if you would like any help with this, give me a shout. If you have any questions, write some comments or get in touch through the show. I'd love to hear from you or do connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear your experience of this and what you're going to do to get, have a bit more give a shitology in your business. Okay, that's it from me today. Take care.